This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Rick Bellison, who's a former trustee and fellow of the American, uh, current fellow, former trustee of the American Numismatic Society, and of course, a great friend to everybody here. Uh, as you may well know, if you know Rick, not only is he uh, very interested and passionate in about ancient coins, but he's also very uh, passionate and interested in the uh, archaeology of uh, Great Britain and particularly Roman Britain and particularly uh, a big fan of Adrian's Wall. I remember when I first met Rick in, uh, I guess it was 2018, uh, we talked a lot about Hadrian's Wall and he was uh, shocked that I had never been to Hadrian's Wall as a archaeologist of the uh, Roman Empire. And so uh, later that next year, I had the opportunity to go on the Hadrian's Wall pilgrimage with him and see the see the uh, important archaeological sites around Hadrian's Wall uh, with him, which was a really great opportunity that I remember uh, very fondly. And of course, uh, the reason I go on to this um, or discuss this anecdote is because what he's talking about today is uh, very much related to that passion of his um, as he participated this uh, this last summer at the excavations at Vindolanda, and that's of course the subject of his talk. So with that, I'll hand it over to Rick. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in Zoom land. It's always a pleasure to have the opportunity to present at the American Numismatic Society. And I am going to be discussing the excavations in Vindolanda, which I, along with uh, Wayne Kimber and Dave Michaels, participate in this, uh, this past summer. Before I get into that, let me just mention that after participating in Vindolanda, I went and attended the International Congress of Studies of the Roman Frontier, which was in Nijmegen. And if you ever get a chance to go to uh, the Netherlands and Germany and visit some of these Roman sites, I would encourage everyone to do so. And also, I was thrilled that on this uh, excursion, I met two former ANS summer seminar students. One was named Craig, and the other was Amanda. And I think Craig has actually uh, helped you out at Hukok, uh, uh Nathan, on your uh, being the numismatist at those excavations in Israel. So anyway, uh, I'm going to now discuss Vindolanda. So excavations at Vindolanda, June 20th to July 1st. As I mentioned, Wayne Kimber and Dave Michaels were participating with me. Also, we had a guest with us who I would encourage you to take a look at her website. Her name is Carol Redato, and she is French, but she lives in Frankfurt. And she has devoted her life to... Uh, following Hadrian's travels. And she has a great website where she writes about his travels. She's got something like 45,000 photographs that are on Flickr. And it's a, it's a wonderful website to visit. Uh, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it if you visit her website. Okay, so what is Vindolanda and where is Vindolanda? Uh, Vindolanda was a Roman fort in Northumbria in northern England, and as you can see from this map, it's 300 miles north of London and 35 miles west of Newcastle. Or if we were to use a time machine and go back to uh, Roman Britain, it's a Roman fort in Britannia, the Roman province of Britannia. It was 300 miles north of the uh, city of Londinium and 35 miles west of the city of Pons Aelius. And I like this map because it shows you the system of Roman walls, and it also shows you where the various uh, Celtic tribes lived in, in Britain. So it's a Roman fort, and it was on a Roman road known as the Stained Gate. Uh, it wasn't called the Stained Gate in Roman times. We actually don't know what it was called in Roman times. Stained Gate is a medieval term. Uh, but I wanted to present this slide to you because it shows you how Northern Britain was really a militarized zone. All those uh, red squares are Roman forts, 
and you can see that they're all connected to each other by uh, Roman roads. And uh, many of these forts have been excavated and you can go and visit them. Of course, the most famous of the Roman forts are the ones on Hadrian's Wall. And here is a close up map uh, showing you this particular part of Northern England. Uh, Vindolanda was, was constructed starting in 85 AD and I'll get into the history, but uh, in 122 AD, the Emperor Hadrian decided that he wanted to build a linear barrier to separate the Romans from the barbarians, you know, the Caledonians, what today we would call Scotland. And so he ordered the construction of a wall, 80 miles, 80 Roman miles, 73 miles in the modern Western miles from the uh, mouth of uh, the Tyne River in the east to the uh, Solway Estuary in the west. And originally it was gonna just be 80 miles with a small fort called a mile castle every mile, and then in between two mile castles, turrets. But then just as the construction started going, getting ahead, uh, he changed his plans and he said he wanted a fort every six or seven miles. So now if you visit Hadrian's Wall, there are uh, 80 mile castles, you know, 160 turrets. And then there are these 16 forts along Hadrian's Wall. And it just turns out that Vindolanda is 1.2 miles south of Hadrian's Wall. So if you visit Vindolanda, it's very convenient to visit Hadrian's Wall. And it's two miles to the southwest of the Hadrian's Wall Fort of Housesteads. It's also to the southeast of another fort called uh, Great Chester's. But Housesteads is the real tourist attraction uh, along Hadrian's Wall. So this is an aerial photograph of what the fort at Vindolanda looks at today. As you can see, it's a very rural area, it's, it's isolated. And uh, if you were to visit it, the most convenient way is to have a car, though technically you can get there by bus. And to give you history, uh, in 55 and 54 BC, Julius Caesar campaigned briefly in Britain. Then in 43 AD, Claudius ordered the invasion and conquest of Britain. Uh, 40 years later in 83 AD, Gaius Julius Agricola defeated the Caledonians at the Battle of Mons Graupius. And we know a lot about him because uh, his son-in-law Tacitus wrote the annals about, uh, about his father-in-law. Now in 84 AD, Agricola was relieved of the governorship and Rome removed the forces from most of Caledonia. Uh, either they were needed elsewhere or the Romans just decided that the investment in uh, military expeditions to occupy uh, this rugged territory just was not economically uh, and politically viable. So they withdrew uh, from what today we would call Scotland and they established more of a, a border area uh, in Northern England. And as part of this establishment of this border region, uh, the Roman fort of Vindolanda was founded in 85 AD and the name is translated to mean white lawn. Uh, now the fort is located on a plateau at the intersection of two streams. And uh, there are natural springs that were abundant. So there's plenty of fresh water and there are all the required resources to build a fort, uh, timber and stone in particular. Uh, this is a, an illustration from a book called The Roman Fort uh, by Peter Connolly from Oxford University Press. Uh, I didn't ask Peter for permission to include this slide, so I hope he'll forgive me. Uh, but this book came out uh, many years ago and uh, it's, it's got wonderful illustrations. Peter Connolly uh, does a fabulous job with his illustrations. And this is his depiction of what the Fort of Vindolanda would have looked at, say, at the, uh, beginning of the second century AD. And there you can see it's on the plateau. And uh, you can see that to the west of the fort, there's actually a civilian settlement called the Vicus. And this fort, as you can see in the illustration is a timber fort. 
Okay. And as I mentioned, uh, if you go through the West Gate, there was a, a village or vicus that had evolved to provide uh, services and entertainment to the, to the soldiers. And uh, the ruins of the vicus are quite interesting to visit. So the Romans occupied Vindolanda from 85 AD until the late fourth or early fifth century. Uh, and then it continued to be occupied by local people for perhaps another century or two. Uh, but eventually it was abandoned and it became a source of building materials as is often the case with Roman Britain. Uh, if you go to Hadrian's Wall, only 10% of the stones are actually still visible because most of them have been taken to build farmhouses and cathedrals, et cetera. So during the period of Roman occupation, Nine forts were actually built on the site, uh, one on top of another. Uh, the first five were constructed of wood, say from 85 to 170 AD, and the next four of stone, say from 170 to 400 AD. And the visible remains are primarily from the fort constructed during the Severan period in 213 AD with later uh, modifications. And as I said, the civilian settlement uh, is still visible and it included an elaborate military bathhouse that was just west of the fort. Uh, and we have a, a good sense of the history of who the troops stationed at Vindolanda. And uh, this fort could accommodate, accommodate between 500 and 1,000 troops. And these were mostly auxiliaries. So the legionaries were initially Italian, then open to all Roman citizens. But auxiliaries were troops from uh, conquered or occupied territories, whereas part of the peace treaty, they would commit troops to help the Romans, and then they would move them to other parts of the Roman Empire. They didn't want these, uh, these young men uh, staying locally where they might become part of a rebellion. So they would shift them to other parts of the, the territories. So uh, from 85 to 92 AD, which would be forts one and two, it was the first cohort of Tungrians uh, from Belgium under uh, Julius Vericondus. And actually, when I went on this uh, Roman frontiers excursion, we visited Tungria. There's a Gallo-Roman museum there. Uh, then from 92 to 105 AD, Fort Number 3 was the ninth cohort of Batavians under Flavius Cerealis. And the Batavians actually were based in Nijmegen, which is where this conference was uh, held. And uh, that's a fascinating place to visit. Uh, then from 105 to 138 AD, you had forts four and five. Once again, the first court of Tongrians, but this time with a detachment from the sixth legion and from the first cohort of Redulians who were Spanish cavalry. So this is a complicated chart but it shows you the various layouts of the forts. So uh, period one is in red, and that would be from 85 to 95 AD. And you can see how that fort was oriented. And then uh, periods two and three, the orientation was changed and the fort was slightly expanded. Uh, and periods four and five, you can see it became a much bigger fort. That's the one in yellow. And then what you see today is what's outlined in the back in white. And so uh, the uh, period six plus fort outline is very similar to the period one, which was timber, but from, from six onward, they were stone. And once again, this is what a period uh, three, four would look like. Uh, this is the Peter Connolly illustration, which I showed you before. Um, but there you can see it's basically the blue outline, two, three, I guess, uh, the blue outline. So uh, then if we look at the uh, stone forts uh, in 138 AD, you had the second cohort of Nervians from Belgium. And then starting in 208 AD with forts seven, eight, and nine, the fourth cohort of Gauls. And then we know that after sometime after 400 AD, uh, a local warlord named Brigo Maglos occupied Vindolanda. And once again, I just show you uh, 
this outline because what you see in white is what the stone forts were. Uh, it's very similar to the red fort from period one. And here again is the initial aerial photograph showing you the remains of the stone fort which is from 213 AD with later modifications. Now I had mentioned that after the Romans left, there was a local warlord named Brigomaglos, and we know about him because they found his tombstone in 1889, it was discovered by the archeologists Robert Blair and Collingwood Bruce. And in this chart, you see, I have a number there, RIB1722A. RIB stands for Roman inscriptions in Britain. Every Roman inscription in Britain that's been recorded has an RIB number, and you can go online and look at all these inscriptions. So this one is in a museum called the Clayton Museum in Chester's, and there you can see the inscription in Latin, uh, Brigomaglos hic iasit quiet briocus, and then the translation, Brigomalos, who's also known as Briocus, lies here. Uh, now, as I mentioned, eventually the locals abandoned Vindolanda and it just became a site from which you could rob out stones. Uh, if we fast forward to the uh, 16th century, there was this uh, renewed antiquarian interest in England's history and an interest in the people who had occupied uh, Britain, the Romans in particular. And you had various scholars uh, reading uh, the texts like of uh, the Venerable Bede, and then to the extent that they could find them visiting these sites and recording them. So uh, one of the uh, most famous is a gentleman named William Camden, and he refers to Vindolanda in his History of Britain, Britannia, which was first published in Latin in 1586 and then translated into English in 1607. However, uh, during Camden's time, this was a very, uh, very dangerous area, the, what's called the Scottish Borders area. It was just, uh, there were these people known as border reavers, and they were outlaws and cattle rustlers, and you were risking your life to, to visit this area. So Camden just heard about Vindolanda secondhand. He actually didn't visit it. However, in 1702, an antiquarian named Christopher Hunter actually did risk his life and he went and visited the area and he reported on it in what's called the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, which was this Royal Society in London. And he reported on seeing the vaulted roof over the military bathhouse. And then in 1717, another antiquarian, John Warburton visited Vindolanda and he actually found an altar which he removed and which is now in a library in Durham. Now, this is the altar found by John Warburton at Vindolanda, uh, which he referred to as Little Chester's. And he found it in 1717. And you can see it has its own RIB number, 1684. And there's the link to Roman inscriptions in Britain, if anyone is interested. Uh, the most important antiquarian in the history of Vindolanda is this gentleman, Anthony Headley. He was a curate of several parishes in Northumbria, and he acquired uh, the properties which encompassed Vindolanda. Then those properties are Chester Home and Codley Gate Farm. He, he acquired them in 1814, and then uh, he did what uh, uh, antiquarians like to do, is do their own personal excavations from 1818 to 1835, and he had a cottage built at 1830 to 1831 at Chester Home so that he could live on site. And he found uh, three uh, stone altars and tombstones, which were uh, of particular interest. And I'm going to now show you pictures of them. So here, if you go to visit Vindolanda, are uh, replicas of the altars found by Headley. There's an open air museum in Vindolanda and you can see replicas. Now you may wonder, why do you see replicas? How come you can't see the actual altars in Vindolanda? It's because of this gentleman who in many ways is a hero. I'd call him the man who saved Hadrian's Wall. 
This is the antiquarian John Henry Clayton. Uh, he was a very wealthy businessman in Newcastle, and he became fascinated by the history of Roman Britain and the history of Hadrian's Wall in particular. And he had the wherewithal to acquire properties that had Roman ruins on them. So he bought up as much of Hadrian Wall and the forts as he could. Uh, and uh, when Anthony Headley died, his daughters didn't have an interest in his antiquarian collection. Uh, I know that feeling. My children have no interest in my collection. And so John Henry Clayton was able to buy Vindolanda from the Headleys in 1863. And he transferred these altars and tombstones to his personal museum, which is the Roman Fort of Chester's, also known as Silurnum. And that's in Hadrian's Wall in the town of Collarford. So here is a picture of John Henry Clayton. Uh, and there was actually in the early 20th century, a book written, an account of the Roman antiquities. And it lists everything in his personal museum at Chester's which now actually is part of English heritage. And these are the altars and the tombstone that were found by Anthony Headley. Uh, here you have the altar of Pituanius Secundus, that's RIB 1685 on the left. In the center, uh, you have Q Petronius Urbicus, that's RIB 1686. And then you have uh, 1687 uh, Marcus, Cecilius, uh, found by Anthony Headley, and now on display in the museum in Chester's. And here we are in the museum in Chester's. These are not the, those three. Uh, the only one of the three in this picture is the one on what looking at it is the right, and that is the altar erected by Q. Petronius Urbicus. But if you visit the Chester's Museum and you wander around, and it's a great place to look, uh, you'll find all three of these stone uh, objects. Also, here is the tombstone of Cornelius Victor, which is found by Anthony Headley and now on display in the Clayton Museum in Chester's. And that has RIB 1713. Uh, now, Clayton continued the excavations. And in 1914, his work crew found an altar to Vulcan with the inscription Vicani Vindolandesis, the villagers of Vindolanda. So here we have uh, archeological proof that this fort was called Vindolanda. And I think it's absolutely wonderful that they, they found this particular object. It was in the Chester's Museum, but now it's on long-term loan to the museum in Vindolanda. So, uh, John Henry Clinton's nephew inherited his estate, but he liked the good life and uh, he fell into debt and that necessitated the sale of the Clayton properties uh, in 1920. Everything okay? Uh, there was a young archeologist uh, named uh, Eric Burley, and he was working at a floor called Bert Oswald, and he heard some of the workers uh, talking about this auction, and he asked them about it and said, well, gee, if you could buy a property, which would you buy? And it was suggested that he acquire uh, Vindolanda. So he asked his dad if he could have uh, some funds to uh, buy his own fort, and uh, and he got Vindolanda. Now, what's interesting is that after the sale, uh, the Fort of Housesteads didn't sell, and he was asked if he'd like to buy that too, uh, but it lacked the additional funds for that purchase. So he ended up with it. Okay. So uh, when World War II started in 1939, Eric Burley went into military intelligence, and uh, the fort was placed under the guardianship of the Ministry of Works. Uh, and Eric Burley moved his family to Durham in 1950, where he became a professor of archaeology. And he sold Vindolanda and Chester home to his tenant farmer, Thomas Harding. Uh, 
Okay, what is going on here? Okay. But right. Now something's going on with these slides. Okay. All right. All right, I'd love to excuse me. Uh, as I mentioned, Eric Burley moved to Durham and he sold the property to his tenant farmer. However, uh, when the farmer was ready to sell the land, the Burley family in 1970 found a donor in the name of Daphne Archibald. And she purchased this land and the Bindalanda Trust was created and uh, eventually, Robin Burley, the son of Eric Burley, resigned his job as a teacher to become the full-time director of the excavations at Vindolanda. And most of the excavation works were carried on by volunteers, a tradition that's continued to the present day. So I happened to visit Vindolanda for the first time in 1992, and I took this photograph, and this shows uh, Robin Burley overseeing the excavations and these excavations are outside the fort in the southwest area, just outside the fort. And in 1992, which is when this picture was taken, his team found a remarkable uh, collection of what are known as the Vindolanda tablets, uh, which are now housed at the British Museum. This is over 350 letters written on thin pieces of wood and these letters had survived the bonfire, which had been set up by troops when they were evacuating the fort in 105 AD. And the letters include intelligence reports, troop manifests, requests for provisions, letters asking for, thanking for care packages, uh, letters seeking redress for mistreatment, and even a birthday party invitation from one commanding officer's spouse to another. So this is my favorite or one of my favorite uh, tablets. It's an intelligence report. And in it, it refers to the Roman, the Romans referring to the locals as Gitunculi or wretched Brits. Here's the inscription. It says, the Britons are unprotected by armor. They are very many cavalry. Uh, the cavalry do not use swords, nor do they wretched Britons take up fixed positions in order to throw javelins. So, you have this phrase, Britunculi, the wretched Britons. Uh, here's another one of my favorites, perhaps my favorite. It's a birthday party invitation. It was from the wife of the commander of a fort called Korea to the wife of the commander of Indolanda. And uh, so a, an invitation from Claudia Severa to Sulpicia Lepidina. And here's what she says. Uh, I send you a warm invitation to come to us of September 11th for my birthday celebrations to make my day more enjoyable by your presence. And uh, she certainly had a way with words and she uh, had a scribe write the invitation and then she signed it. And the inscription from Severa is the oldest known handwriting of a woman uh, from the history of the Western world. Uh, this is another fascinating find from 1997. This is a tombstone dating to the early reign of Hadrian. Uh, and it indicates that a soldier named Titius Annius had been killed in Britain in battle. And uh, here is the tombstone itself with the translation. Uh, so to the shades of the dead, Titus Annius, centurion of the first cohort of Tungrians, with X years of service, aged Y, killed in war. His son and his heirs under his will had made this. And what's significant about this is that we know in part, the Emperor Hadrian decided to build this wall because uh, of how dangerous it had gotten in the North. And so here you have specific archeological evidence that there had, there had been fighting in this region around this period of time any Roman soldier had been killed. So uh, the Vindolanda tablets and this tombstone are among the most fascinating finds. Now, uh, Robin's uh, son, Andrew, is now running the excavations. 
Uh, he took over as director of excavations in 2005 and CEO in 2015, and he does a wonderful job. So just uh, recounting uh, the Burley era for Vindolanda, Eric Burley uh, acquired uh, Vindolanda uh, in 1929. Uh, his son, uh, Robin, uh, took over from him, and then his son, Andrew, took over from him. There's one other famous Burley, and this is uh, Robin Burley's uh, brother, Anthony, and um, he became a professor and he's written many books. Some of them you might have written, read. There's one about uh, Adrian and another about Septimius Severus. And I should uh, mention that Robin Bur Burley was named after one of the most famous British archeologists, R.G. Collingwood, and Anthony Burley was named after Anthony Headley. So the Vindolanda Trust has responsibility for the excavations at Vindolanda and also operates the Museum at Vindolanda, the gift shop and the coffee shop where if you're excavating, it's one of the places you can have lunch. And this is a photograph of the interior of the museum and they have an extensive display of coins. They found thousands of coins at Vindolanda and they have uh, some of them on display. Uh, the Vindolanda Trust also operates the Roman Army Museum at Carvoren, which is 5.6 miles west of Vindolanda, and that is adjacent to the Roman Fort of Magna, where excavations are planned for next year. So uh, I'm now going to discuss what you need to do if you want to volunteer at Vindolanda, and the timing uh, for giving you this information is perfect because registration occurs on November 1st. So the excavations are under the direction of Andrew Burley. He has two assistant archeologists, Marta Alberti and Penny Trickler. And uh, Andrew's wife, Patricia Burley, is responsible for conservation. And uh, they actually met on the excavations. And uh, starting on November 1st, uh, there's gonna be online registration if you are interested in being a volunteer. It's for a two-week session. There are uh, 12 to 13 two-week sessions. They begin in, in March or April, and they end in September. And it's approximately 25 volunteers participate per session, and the spots fill up very quickly. Uh, you have to pay a 200-pound fee if you're interested in being a volunteer, uh, and then you have to join Friends of Mindalanda, which costs about 30 pounds. And there are lodgings available both at Vindolanda and nearby. And if you excavate and you want to stay at the Headley Center in Vindolanda, then the cost is a thousand pounds for a single room and 1700 pounds for two people. So the registration will be uh, this coming November 1st at 12 noon Greenwich Mean Time, which is 4 a.m. in California, 6 a.m. in Chicago, 7 a.m. in New York. 1 a.m. for anyone in Hawaii. Uh, and it fills up uh, relatively quickly. So if you have an interest uh, and you're in the US, you, you want to be on your computer uh, at those times to see if you can get a spot. Now I'm going to talk about the experience that uh, I had uh, along with Wayne and Dave Michaels and our friend Cal Rodato. We approached from the east. So this is what you see. As I said, it's it's isolated and very rural and uh, highly recommended to have a car to get around. You can see a cow in the field in the foreground and kind of in the middle there are the ruins of Vindolanda. And uh, we stayed at a place called the Colligate Farmhouse, which accommodates uh, four people very comfortably. And the directions were to turn left at the Roman milestone on the stain gate. This is the only uh, intact Roman milestone in situ in all of Roman Britain. Unfortunately, the cows rubbing against it have rubbed off the inscription, but it is in situ and intact. And as you can see, the Caldegate farmhouse is very nice. It dates to the 19th century, but it was recently remodeled and a very comfortable place to stay, as you can see. Uh, there is an archaeology center where we all meet in the morning. So a typical day is 
uh, you meet at 930. So for us, we'd have to leave around 915 to walk to the Robin Road Archaeology Center. Uh, you work until 12, then you got a lunch for an hour. You work until 3. Uh, it's England, so you have tea time from 3 to 3.30, 3.30 uh, to 4.30 to work and clean up. And uh, that's the schedule, Monday through Friday, you have the weekends off. So Monday starts with an orientation. This is uh, Andrew Burley on the left and Marta Alberti on the right, and they they're very actively involved, uh, so don't don't feel intimidated. Like you feel like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. They're there, and if you have any questions, they're very approachable. And you start by gathering all your tools: the trowel, brush, dustpan, bucket, knee pad, spade, mattock, and wheelbarrow. You can see uh, the excavation site right there, and uh, so. You get your tools and you start to work. And there I am. And uh, you are part of a team. So I met my trench mates. I had three of them. And uh, right off the bat, we started finding organic material because uh, the way Vindolanda is situated, it's a very kind of waterlogged, kind of boggy area. And as I mentioned, there are nine layers of forts and the first five or wooded. Well, organic material is very well preserved in these anaerobic layers. Uh, and so when you get to these wet, moist anaerobic layers, you tend to find a lot of anaerobic, uh, well-preserved organic material. So on the left, you can see that's uh, Andrew Burley with Alex, and they found, she's found a piece of tent leather. And then on the right, uh, that's a clump of, uh, of anaerobic we preserve soil that has within it a wooden writing tablet. And there is the tablet. Uh, you know, sometimes you can see the etching from the stylus into the wood, but in this case, it was blank. And because of the anaerobic uh, conditions preserving organic material, Vindolanda has the largest collection of Roman footwear in the world. They have something like 5,000 pieces of Roman footwear. where you're obviously not going to display all 5,000, but here you can see a representative sample of the leather shoes they found. Uh, my first meaningful find was an arrowhead. Uh, there you can see it. Uh, now, a lot of uh, what you find is a certain random luck, just like the guy who caught Aaron Judge's home run ball being at the right place at the right time. Uh, Wayne and Dave were assigned to an area where there just wasn't a lot of material finds to be made. So they spent most of their time just digging, uh, uncovering the archaeological structures. And, and uh, it, was, it was rewarding from that point of view, but not so from the point of view of finding lots of stuff to get excited about. Uh, and we all spent time cleaning the finds. So, uh, here they are, Dave and Wayne, uh, with their scrub brushes, cleaning off uh, the pottery and the, and the bones and other things that were found. And here's an example, two examples of the pottery that's found. Uh, there you can see a gladiatorial scene on the left, and on the right side is a more kind of erotic scene. Uh, my second find was a ballista bolt head. They find quite a few of these. This is in the museum. There's the, an example uh, of the ballista bolt head. And this is what a ballista would have looked like. And so you have this basically an arrow on steroids that they shoot out of these machines and they're deadly. I have to say that archeology span is not glamorous work. It's a lot of uh, uh, just troweling and, and shoveling and filling buckets and, filling, and emptying wheelbarrows. And so there are moments of frustration where you'll ask yourself, you know, what am I doing here? Uh, but then you will find something and it'll make it all worthwhile. And then just being part of the team is also a very uh, fulfilling experience. Um, so this is an example of being in a team. There's Gary, and he's been using a spade to, to, to create these clumps of, of earth, which are put in the bucket and then dumped into a wheelbarrow. 
And then you have to go through meticulously with your fingers, uh, breaking the, these clumps up into little pieces and seeing is there, is there an artifact in here? Uh, and uh, lo and behold, I experienced the, the thrill of finding a coin in uh, the wheelbarrow, breaking up these clumps. I was uh, just breaking it up. It was getting kind of monotonous. And then all of a sudden I felt something and it felt disc-like and thin. And then I said to myself, oh boy, it's, it's a coin. Now, I was so excited, I immediately blurted out coin. And I think within two seconds, Angela had come and taken it from me. If I had to do it again, I would have savored the moment. But there is the coin. And uh, they right away, they bag it and tag it. And this is an, an as of Domitian. Uh, and we'll take a look at the coin. There's what I found. Obviously, uh, if you're at a coin show, you're probably going to find a coin like this in a, quote, junk box. Not in, in, you know, it's not the most beautiful coin in the world. But when you find it on an excavation, it's a very, very, very special feeling. And, uh, you know, when you find them on excavations, obviously they're part of the archaeological record and they're turned in. But you, know, you can't keep it, unfortunately. So you just have to live with the memory because you can always buy a coin like this in the market. And in fact, I have one. Um, but this is just an absolute thrill to get it. And this is a better example of the coin. So it, it was from 87 AD and the reverse is Virtutui Augusti. So thrill of my life, the first coin I found and the excavations had been the Londa. Uh, so uh, on the left, it's the end of my first week's work. Uh, you can see the soil is very dark. That's indicative of uh, anaerobic layer. And what you see there covered over, that actually was wab and dawdle, daub and waddle fencing that we wanted to keep moist. Uh, when you uh, uncover this organic material, you need to you can conserve it or keep it moist or it can deteriorate rapidly. And on the right, I was assigned to a neat new trench. And I said, it's not glamorous. I had to clear out all of those stones and dirt and everything to expose a sidewall. That was my task. Uh, and I said, we're part of a team. And right away, Gary, who's part of our team, found this quern stone. Uh, it turned out that there was a French film crew doing a documentary. So uh, Marta, the archaeologist, explained to this crew how a quern stone was used to mill uh, flour. And uh, I think the second day on site, this little disc popped out another coin. And anytime you find an important object, you have to uh, take notes as to exactly uh, where it was located and the depth it was located and so forth. So there I'm positioning for them to record that data. This time, I did follow my advice and I savored the moment about finding this coin. And this is a denarius. And as you can see, uh, unlike the Domitian, where it was obvious immediately uh, who the emperor was, in this case, it, the coin needed to be conserved to tell who it was. And this is the coin once it's cleaned. As you can see, it is, uh, it's got its condition issues, but it is a uh, denarius of Crispina, the wife of Commodus. The reverse is Hilaritis, and it dated to 178 to 182 AD. And this helps to uh, date that particular trench I was working in. The first one was from the, you know, uh, 87 AD. And here we are, a completely different site, almost 100 years later uh, in the Antonine period or post-Antonine period. And this is what a better example would look like. And uh, this particular coin, I wouldn't say it's extremely rare, but it's not as common as you, you might think. I don't have one in my collection. And so I went you know, to V coins and MA coins to look if there was one I could buy. And uh, there weren't that many examples for sale. And I'd actually like to get one from this exact same die. So I'm waiting for one to appear. Uh, other things I found, this is part of a trumpet brooch. 
on the right are exam better preserved examples in the museum. Uh, found a lot of nails, uh, and especially hobnails. Plenty of pottery. Uh, this is the red Samian ware from Gaul. Then the local pottery, which is called coarse ware, uh, glass ware. Uh, this particular slide shows you the piece of glass I found on the left and on the right, you can see in the museum, it would have been from a handle uh, from a, a glass jug. And then uh, this is a flu tile from the heating system. So, you know, you'd have under the floor heating with a hypocaust system and you'd have these flu tiles uh, going behind the walls and they would help to warm the room. This is for the commanding officer's home or for important buildings. As I mentioned, we were filmed by this uh, Channel 5 film crew uh, and they also had a drone hovering over us. And, you know, as I mentioned, it's a thrill to find an artifact, but sometimes your assignment is to clear an area to expose a wall uh, or something uh, that the archaeologists just want to see. And in this case, I just removed all this rocks and soil and so forth. I did find the coin. I found some artifacts. But in the end, my objective was to expose this wall. And there it is. And I have to say, once you're digging, you can really get into it. And uh, I, I was thrilled that I could accomplish this goal within a week. And here is a drone shot, not from the film crew. Vinda Landa does drone shots before and after. So on the left, you've got a drone shot before the beginning of the week and at the end of the week. And if you look there in the center where you can see initially that uh, wall was a little bit uh, exposed and at the end of the week, it's fully exposed. So mission accomplished. Uh, this is our group. Uh, about 25 volunteers. Uh, Wayne is in the far left in this picture behind everyone else. Uh, the picture was supposed to be taken on Friday, which is when we're supposed to get our purple shirts and wear them, uh, but they decided to do it on Thursday uh, and Wayne was wearing his purple shirt. So he wanted to hide behind everyone. And there, there you can see D Dave at the far right uh, once again, but Fortunately, I ran back at lunchtime and I got my purple shirt and I'm close to that, the center, just to the left, I'm wearing a purple hat to match my purple shirt. And in the background there is a replica of a Roman fort. Uh, this is done because they have a lot of school trips and, and visitors, hundreds of visitors to Vindolanda and they wanted them to see, well, this is what it looked like in ancient days. So they got a replica. And I should mention that one of the uh, nice and fun things about Vindolanda is the tourists and the visitors, the school kids, they're all watching you and they will ask you questions. And, you know, it's fun to interact with them and you, you do your best to answer the question. If you can't answer it, you get Andrew or Marta to come over and answer it. So uh, that aspect of the excavation is a lot of fun. Uh, here we are. This is our foursome with the archaeologists. Uh, so that's Penny and Martha in the background. Then Dave, Wayne, Carol, uh, myself, and that's Andrew Burley. And here we are. Uh, once again, just the four of us, Dave, Carol, Wayne, and myself. And it's a, a very picturesque place. And it stays light until like 11. When we were there, I think it, it it was light still 10, 11 p.m. It was still uh, close to sunset. So there's a beautiful picture. And then the weekend uh, between week one and two, they had a Roman reenactors festival in York. And uh, Dave Michaels is actually a very serious Roman reenactor, as is his wife. And so we went to York. And here's a picture of Dave with me. I'm lazy, so I just ordered a Roman uh, uh armor lorica segmentata hoodie on ebay and there's wayne in his centurion costume and there to the right you see wayne with his wife lori and there's carol uh, so we had a very good time doing this and with that i'm going to uh end my screen sharing
Uh, and uh, I should mention, I didn't say that much about coins other than the two coins that I found, but uh, there is a book about the Roman coins found in Vindolanda, uh, which you can order online if you're interested. Only one gold coin has been found in Vindolanda. It was a coin of the Emperor Nero and was found in 2014. And uh, let me see, there is a picture of it. It was found by a volunteer. Um, so let me stop at that point and see if there are any questions and uh, apologize for some of the technical glitches at the beginning and kind of in the middle of the presentation. Great, thank you very much, Rick. That was a great presentation, giving us an overall view of the site and also telling us specifically about your experiences there, uh, especially discovering those coins, which must have been really exciting as you related. Um, we do have one question in the chat already. Um, he, uh, Bob Hogue asks, uh, what are the immediate conservation measures taken to protect the uh, highly perishable organic remains. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I'll say that they are experts at this because uh, they've been well aware of the anaerobic conditions and the need to preserve organic materials. So as soon as uh, they are found, uh, they are whisked away to the conservation lab. The specifics as to what they do in the conservation lab, uh, I don't know. Uh, um, you know, that Barbara Burley is the expert and she could, if you're interested, maybe we could even have her do some type of presentation on the conservation of organic materials, but uh, they are experts at conserving it. Um, but you know, for things that you leave in place, you want to keep it moist because the minute it dries out, you know, it gets ruined. And so, uh, when they're excavating in the organic layer, anaerobic layers, uh, as we saw afterwards, they will actually cover all that up with soil again. So it will be uh, conserved and preserved uh, underneath uh, layers of, of rubble that are placed on top of it. So what we did, uh, and it was, I personally think I moved three to five tons of soil at the end of the day, that'll all be put back there to, you know, preserve those existing anaerobic layers. Thank you. Um, are there other questions? I see Mike Markowitz has something in the chat. Uh, you're welcome to unmute yourself as well and ask directly if you like. Thanks, Nathan. I asked, are all the coins found at Vindolanda individual stray finds, or were there any larger hordes? No, they have found uh, hordes as well, uh, but uh, most of the finds are stray finds. But the, in the early excavations done by Eric Burley, uh, he found uh, several hordes, and uh, I think Anthony Headley also. Also, uh, there's a signal tower nearby and a quarry, and at one time, one of those little uh, Roman... Um, coin purses was found with like 50 coins in it up there. Thank you. Um, we've got a, a note from Robert Ronas. He says, you carry your great learning lightly. Uh, I think we can all agree with that. Uh, any Anyone else have any questions for Rick? Yeah, well, uh, I've enjoyed giving the presentation. For those who love coins and want tons of coins in the slides, I apologize that there are only pictures of two coins. Uh, on the whole excavation, uh, we found four coins in total. So you found half the coins? Yes. That's and, no, and they were not seeded for me. I, I, they, <laughs> Uh, I think we have time for another question or comment if anybody has anything. What, 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 um, what is the next big, is there a big area still uh, to be excavated? Is there still a potential significant uh, finds or is most of it now done? 
Well, they like to say it'll take 150 years to excavate the entire site. Uh, most of the fort itself has been excavated. Um, the, uh, the northeast quadrant has not been as intensively excavated, but that whole area to the west of the fort is the civilian settlement and so forth. There are temples and cemeteries, and you know that could take years and years to excavate. Um, so the excavations at Vindalanda the will be continuing. And now next year, they're gonna start excavating this Hadrian's Wall Fort at Fort Magna, which is by the Roman Army Museum in Carvoran. And one of the issues of concern uh, for both Vindalanda and Magna, as I mentioned, you know, the preservation of these anaerobic conditions depends on these anaerobic conditions, which depends on moisture in the soil. And with the global, uh, you know, cl with climate change, the area is kind of drying out. And if that process continues, many of these anaerobic conditions will go away and the stuff that's being preserved underground now uh, will end up deteriorating as, as those layers dry out. So in a way you could say that the, they're very motivated to get these excavations at Magna going as soon as possible, uh, just because they don't know how long they will be able to work in the anaerobic conditions. I see a couple more questions coming up in the chat. Again, you're welcome to unmute yourself and uh, ask directly if you like, otherwise I'll read them. So David uh, Vagie asks, um, the Nero Aureus was quite worn. What date was the stratum in which it was found? Um, yeah, that's a, a great question. I'll have to get back to you to, to tell you I don't know off the top of my head, but I'll find out uh, to the best of my knowledge and get back to you on that. But yeah, it was extremely worn and obviously had been in circulation for a long time. Rick, so yeah, I was, muted one. Yeah, go ahead. Rick, I was gonna ask if uh, the archeologists use metal detectors to go over the ground in advance of actually digging. Uh, no, they don't. As a matter of fact, they're kind of very anti-metal detector. They're, uh, they want us to you know, be very careful, eagle-eyed, using our fingers to go through all the clumps. And part of it is they're very concerned about night hawks. And uh, you, you, know, you get a lot of people visiting. And if those visitors saw archaeologists with metal detectors, some of them might think to themselves, oh, you know what? I'll come back here at uh, 2 a.m. with my metal detector. And uh, this is an issue for, for uh, all these scheduled sites in England. Now, the, they have a pretty good system called the Portable Antiquities Scheme, where people are allowed to metal detect with certain ru rules. But you're not allowed to metal detect on scheduled sites. And so they wanted to discourage even the planting of that idea in somebody's head. And so, because we asked that question ourselves, because we're dumping, you know, tons and tons of soil. And you think as eagle eyed as we are, you know, we're going to miss stuff. And it does get monotonous. And the more monotonous it gets, the less likely you are to be paying attention and you could miss something. But no, they, they do not use metal detectors. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.